Okay, I hope this is working, which means we start with some handwritten notes. Um, so the tutorials will be about double bracket flows. Double bracket flows. And this is um, something that was defined in the 80s and maybe 80s and 70s. But let's say I will say 80s in dynamical systems. And uh, in 90s, um, it seems a, a, an independent development uh, in condensed matter physics. Physics. OK, so this is more or less where it appeared. And it's a way of constructing a unitaries that do something nice. In particular, so basically those are unitary flows, which means we uh, it's a one parameter family of unitaries where L is a real parameter and I will call this flow duration. So it's, it's a continuous set, it's a flow of unitaries. And those unitaries can do different things. They can do sorting, perfect matching, or so like graph matching problems. But uh, I will be talking only about diagonalization. So they can diagonalize uh, diagonalization. So in, um, in the modern nomenclature, we would uh, talk about expressive powers of circuits. And this is a set of equations that you can construct. And we would say that the expressive powers of double bracket flows in particular includes diagonalization, which is a useful thing, okay? But I will be talking about those double bracket flows in context of quantum computing. And for quantum computing, we need to discretize this because um, I wrote down dynamical systems to indicate that those are differential equations. So, um, so if we want to do quantum algorithms, uh, I think I see Akash raising hands uh, in chat. Yeah, so, so I have a question like, you said this is the flow duration, right? And I have like a doubt about that. How the, like, what is the flow duration and how it connects with constructing an unitary? Yeah, so, um, so that's a slightly more complicated story. And today I wanted to talk about discretizing those flows directly um, and, um, and then getting uh, discrete iterations. So in quantum algorithms, we will do discrete steps. Now, mm. if we want to talk about those flows, uh, then the story is sometimes a little bit more complicated for uh, quantum info people. But OK, let's try to define it in five minutes. Um, so um, if you give me an input Hamiltonian H, I can set it to be the starting point of the flow of that Hamiltonian. So I write kind of curly letters for the continuously flowed quantities. And this H0 is your input, and you want to diagonalize this. Now, you could say that starting from this point on, you have a diagonalizing flow, which is rotating this H0, UL dagger so that you get some float Hamiltonian HL. And now this L is um, the same parameter you have in a differential equation. So let's say I have X um, of T in R to power D, and then I can write D T X of T is some function F X of T. That's a possibly nonlinear system of equations. And whatever I'm, whatever is the parameter where I'm taking the derivative here, 
it's kind of the the zipper of evolving forwards the, this um, solution to this differential equation okay so this is what we would have just for a differential equation yeah so i don't know one example is x uh, double derivative is plus minus x of time and either we get an exponential or or, uh, or some oscillations and so on yeah so i could also square it i could make like third power that would be some nonlinear oscillators and so on so i can have a linear or, or nonlinear um, equation and now uh, now what is the equation that uh, that we want Basically, um, this unitary should arise as the solution to a generalization of the Heisenberg equation. DLHL is D of HL. I will explain in one moment. HL bracket, close this, and then HL. So if I would have an equation where I say dt a of t, and then maybe I put an i here, is b of t, a of t, then we would say that this is the Heisenberg equation. This is the Heisenberg equation um, with the Hamiltonian, which is b of t. And in this uh, Heisenberg equation, the operator a evolves in the Heisenberg picture. Okay, here we have something similar, only that we have this bracket, and we could call this bracket something. So let me call WL to be this bracket that I'm not yet defining what, exactly what it is. But just to explain well, what is this flow duration, okay? And now you could view this as um, HL can be seen to be some complex matrix, which is D by D. But I could vectorize. So this is a first order differential equation, but it's a nonlinear differential equation because if I look at the matrix elements here, I take some products here using the commutators. Okay. So basically the flow unitary, this UL, which defines this double bracket flow, is the solution of a generalization of the Heisenberg equation where the form of the equation is a double bracket. In the regular equation, we have uh, the Hamiltonian here and a single bracket, but we take something which acts like a Hamiltonian, so to speak. If I put an I here, it will all work. And it's already in the form of a bracket. That's basically what came out from this literature in, in double bracket flows or those Gwazek wilson wilson Wegner flows. Okay, it's basically a differential equation, and it's a prescription for a unitary to uh, con it's a prescription for a unitary using a differential equation. You can view the Schrodinger equation as a prescription to get also a unitary equation, but now we are writing a prescription using a nonlinear differential equation. Okay. That's mostly all I want to say about uh, double bracket flows, uh, which are continuous flows, and that's why they are more complicated, but we are not very well suited. So Akash, tell me whether this made sense, what I said, maybe I repeat something still. Yeah, so what I understood that it's like a new way of presenting like these commutators, right? Like the relationship, maybe, right? Between the operators and stuff, like the observable. So when I say yeah. when I say double bracket flow, when I say double bracket flow, it means that I will take an ansatz for a different way of constructing unitaries, which will uh, which will be of the form of this double bracket. It's a different ansatz for for constructing unitary operators. Schrodinger equation is one way, hmm. and if you take those brackets, it turns out that you have nice properties. Okay. If we have yeah. time, maybe we will see those um, properties derived for discrete uh, iterations. Uh, but I would like to speak about double bracket iterations. And this is much, much simpler to understand. 
and um, and you realize you don't need to know all those continuous flows. Those continuous flows are also not helpful for quantum computing in the sense that you would have a good way of implementing them. So, so those double bracket iterations are actually much more natural for quantum algorithms. That's why I want to skip there. But then you can see that the DBF, the double bracket flow, is a continuum limit. Yeah. So the, uh, and the preceding literature you can view as the continuous limit of whatever we will discuss today. Yeah. I think at some point maybe we will go back to those continuous flows, but I don't want to over, uh, overwhelm you with those equations like this is the, the equation here. It's just a differential equation. And if you solve this e equation in NumPy, you can try to solve this equation in NumPy, you will get a sequence of HLs, those HLs that arise actually for a, from a unitary rotation. And you will see that as L goes towards infinity, you get always more diagonal. That's why it's a diagonalizing flow. So. I don't know which which way is the most comfortable for you to view the flows. That's why I would say, let's have a look at, uh, let's have a look at double, uh, double bracket iterations. So, double bracket iteration. So let's define this problem to say I get a Hamiltonian from you as input, input Hamiltonian. Okay, and with this input Hamiltonian, I would like to do something with it. And uh, the task is uh, make it diagonal. And now the question is, how do you do this? In NumPy, you will do this by certain um, algorithms. And those algorithms are not very good for quantum computing because in quantum computing, we usually evolve systems so that's not so easy to translate but we can do certain things and that's why those methods from condensed matter theory are very useful now i will directly talk about a generalization so i will make a dbi so the task of dbi is i give you an input hamiltonian and your task is to make it diagonal in an iterative way that works for a quantum computer and we will see that that i'm kind of answering this question so um, so let's talk about a DBI uh, uh, ansatz. And an ansatz is something where you have to trust me that it works. Then you take the ansatz and you see that it works. That's what we want to see today. So uh, what will be my ansatz? And then I tell you why this is a good ansatz and why it makes sense. So I, you gave me already the input Hamiltonian H0. So I will construct the first bracket W where I will take some D0 operator and H0. And in my ansatz where D0 is diagonal. That's my ansatz. I just said, let me create a bracket, okay? And now, uh, now a useful fact. If I take some small s, which is a real parameter, it can be also long, whatever, and I take the exponential us e to s w zero, then u s inverse is u s dagger. Okay which means it's unitary. So you see, it's quite simple. You give me a Hamiltonian. I do my DBI ansatz that I claim is, is nice and will be interesting. I take this ansatz with a, forming a commutator with some diagonal operator, D0. And then I see, oh, I can use this ansatz for the DBI bracket. This we will call dBi bracket. I take this ansatz and now I can check because what will happen is that if I define Hs 
which, uh, okay, actually I want a different notation. I want h of s, h of s, which is e to, let's say, s w zero, h zero, e to s minus uh, this. First thing we see that, um, that uh, because U S U S dagger is identity. H of S same spectrum as H zero. So this is something good. Okay, and now we want to talk about something that happens. And today maybe I will only make the claim, and and next time we we discuss some more how to prove it. But let's see. Maybe we have enough time. So now let me define um, sigma of H zero uh, to be the restriction to the of diagonal. Of H zero. Now I could also look at H of S and that would be the off diagonal part of diagonal again the restriction to the off diagonal of h of s and now i could uh, i could also define delta of h of 0 which i will need which is the diagonal restriction restriction So you see what I'm doing? I'm splitting H0 into the diagonal part and the off diagonal part. So you give me some matrix and then this is Delta and everything away from the diagonal is Sigma. Okay, just this kind of split. Okay, very good. So why I need this is because I can make a claim now that something happens when I take my ansatz. And what happens is that I can look at the two norm of this of diagonal part after the rotation. Uh, squared, which is trace of sigma h of s squared okay it's a very simple way to say i had some weird matrix i took my diagonalization step now i claim i did some diagonalization with that so let me check whether it has an off diagonal so i throw away what i have on the diagonal and i look at the orange part and i transform this into one number to say how much of the of diagonal you have. And this I answer with this measure. It's the two norm. And the two norm is defined by uh, by the Hilbert-Schmidt scalar product. ABHS is trace of A dagger B. Okay. And from this, I can define this two norm which is also uh, the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of some A, uh, Hilbert-Schmidt squared. It's trace of A dagger A. This A dagger A is important because your matrix might not be Hermitian. Sigma of H of S is Hermitian. Why? Because H of S is Hermitian, so the off diagonal is also Hermitian. So I could write this kind of stuff. That's the kind of tutorial remark today. Pay attention to this because that will be important. Okay, that's a small subtlety that is important. Okay, a great moment for any kind of question. Let me check chat now, I think, okay. If you want to unmute yourself, I think it will show up for me because if I'm sharing, I don't see the chat, but if you raise your hand, then, then it will notify me. Okay, it's so very simple stuff now. Um, and now next we, we can study what's going on with those equations. And, um, and what we will find is that 
and if I will look at, at this um, off diagonal restriction here, so let me write it like this. I can check how much it's changed with your input Hamiltonian. Okay. And what I claim is what that we can show that this is S of D zero H zero. And then what I can do is take the scalar product of Delta of H zero comma H zero. And that's our Hilbert Schmidt scalar product plus some terms which are bounded as S O squared. So there are two things that we should do. We should prove this relation and we should try to understand what's happening. So a uh, most important case is GWWDBI. So there's a very special double bracket flow, this continuous equation, which is named in physics, well, it was kind of communicated by Gwazek and Wilson, and then also by Wegener. So uh, those W's in the, the name are uh, kind of related to why I call the bracket W, yeah? So for those um, flows, we have our brackets and here we would choose D zero to be the same that appears there. And then there's a, mono, a monograph, a book by Karine I think maybe 2007 or something. I don't remember the date, so I want to write the date. But there's a, a book called Flow Equations. And that's as close as we get to a textbook on the subject. Um, and yeah, and that studies this and the, it's it's basically uh, showing what happened after those papers in condensed matter and what people learned for different condensed matter physics uh, papers. But uh, basically, in that book, you will see that that's, um, Karine uh, re uh, refers to this bracket that I just wrote down there. So wait, I will call this inverted W because we can have different brackets and I will call it some canonical bracket H0. So that's the special bracket. And you see that we can also have this, we can also write it in this way. Uh, why can I write it like this? Short recap. I said here that we can split the Hamiltonian into the diagonal and off diagonal part. And of course, if I insert this, the commutator is linear and delta commutes with delta, so it goes away. So you see this commutator that I wrote down is actually the non-commuting, the non-commuting, uh, I don't know, competition of the diagonal with the off-diagonal. That's in some way, I don't know, it's, um, it's in how far, so when we are rotating, when we set D0 to this, we are rotating with this canonical bracket, this very special in, uh, bracket here. And uh, uh, and that's kind of rotating by, so if this is big, then we will rotate a lot, right? So if it's very non-commuting delta with sigma, then we are rotating a lot, okay? And this is a canonical bracket because in this case, in this case, the equation above, I will rewrite it. So I look at what, after I rotate the Hamiltonian by my ansatz, I look at the off diagonal, then I check how much I have of the off diagonal and I compare it with the same measure of the off diagonal stuff initially. Uh, but then we see that this is minus S, the norm squared, uh, norm squared of this uh, inverted W, so M, M0 squared HS. 
I think I messed up a sign, so there might be a plus. I think there's a plus. So we need to check. And the plus appears because if D0 is delta of H0, then the scalar product D0 with H0, commutator close, open new commutator, delta of H0, comma H0, is what we had above to use the scalar product to define the norm. OK, but it's important that in this scalar product, this will be trace uh, of a W dagger W. OK, this is just by definition like this. And then in the equations, we need to keep track of the minus signs. It's for sure that we have something like this. So maybe when I expanded the, the I, uh, I might be messing up the sign here. Okay, but this is not important. We will be doing the derivation line by line and we will find it. I know with the norm, so when I'm choosing this canonical uh, bracket ansatz, the special one that is motivated uh, by previous flows in condensed matter, we get something which is very pretty because up to something which is kind of small, we see that the magnitude of the off diagonal compared to the initial magnitude of the off diagonal is a negative number. Yeah, so the difference between those magnitudes is uh, is negative, which means I reduced it with this ansatz, okay? And that's a very good thing, because I told you that this ansatz takes the Hamiltonian, then you exponentiate it, you get a unitary, or maybe you can put this on a quantum computer. And now what does this unitary step do? If this S is small enough, then initially you're decreasing the magnitude of the of diagonal terms as measured by the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. Okay, that's what we are learning from this claim here. Okay, so this is let's call it um, monotonicity. Of DBI. Now with this plus minus convention here. This is actually quite nice because let's say I choose a D0 where this doesn't work and I'm actually increasing it. You see, this is actually completely linear in D0. So if one direction of D0 was increasing it, I can consider another D0 prime, D0 prime, which is minus D0 which will flip the sign here because there's only one D0 here. The scalar product is linear. And here you have H0, 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 only one D0, which will flip the sign of the scalar product. So you will start diagonalizing. So now my ansatz is pretty good because in half of the choices of your diagonal operators, you will be diagonalizing, yeah? And that's why I don't remember this plus minus because you need to be careful about the signs, uh, how you derive everything. And um, I write here plus minus, oops. Uh, I write plus minus because that plus minus will depend on whether I'm rotating here with a plus minus and in which order I'm rotating here, of course. Right? But I can flip this sign by just the choice of that zero. That's why... Um, I'm not sure yet, but um, that's some things we want to check. Okay, if no questions or maybe some complaints. So now I showed you how this general equation for this D0 ansatz, where this is any diagonal operator, and you see this statement is claiming that either D0 or, or minus D0 will reduce at least a little bit, will uh, reduce the off diagonal path. But because it's unitary, then it means it's a step of a diagonalization. OK? And now I think in 15 minutes, we might have trouble to prove the thing. So I uh, need to decide whether to show you how this equation works, how we obtain the equation, or to tell you how to use it. 
So I think I want to tell you how to use it. So now let's say uh, we find uh, S0 such that we get a max reduction of this off diagonal norm H of S. H S squared. Then I can define H one, and I can um, define this to be H zero of S S zero. Okay, and then I can repeat. So I can uh, do a rotation H one of S. And I can define H2. So this rotation now I will do by taking the bracket D1 with this H1 that I just defined. And that's how I get a diagonalizing uh, iteration because I get H1 of S1, which is something I, I could try to find. But uh, we get the promise that if it's small enough, at least I was reducing a little bit. So one of them will do, but maybe you can choose it in some way optimally. And then we keep doing this. And because we assume that we remove a non-zero chunk of this of diagonal magnitude, at some point we need to start converging towards zero. Yeah. So now you get those questions, how to choose D0, how to choose S1, uh, is this the best strategy and how to implement it on a quantum computer. Okay. But those are the analytical essentials that we kind of understand now, yeah? That basically, um, I think the coolest part is somewhere here because it's very simple. You give me the Hamiltonian, I construct this bracket, I can exponentiate this bracket getting a unitary operator, and that's my ansatz. My new rotated Hamiltonian is the initial Hamiltonian rotated by something I get using the Hamiltonian. So all the information here is got, uh, taken from H0. That's why I could do the same game to get H1 of S to be E2 S W1, H1 E2 minus S W1, where W1 will be some new diagonal operator that you are free to choose with H1, right? And I keep repeating this and that's the double bracket iteration. Much simpler. Uh, in terms of like data structures than, than the differential equations. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's discuss a little bit uh, how to do the proof. So I have like a quick question. Yeah. You said in the GWW case, it's a special case, right? where maybe we know the diagonal terms of this initial Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. And we consider this like DW as the diagonal of the Hamiltonian, right? But in general case, when we don't know the H0, then what do you choose like this D0? Like any diagonal Hamiltonian or something? Any diagonal matrix? Yeah, yeah. So it's basically, this is where it becomes variational and that's where it needs to be the kind of appropriate answers for the problem. Um, this, I think, is kind of like a case-specific, um, it's case-specific, uh, yeah, how, how you do this. You have certain methods in, in quantum machine learning and so on, trying to get some gradients that lower some cost functions, so you can try this. Um, but what you get is that you're making an educated ansatz where this bracket is the key part. It doesn't, doesn't matter which diagonal thing you take. All of them, because of the bracket, start diagonalizing. Yeah. So that's what those equations uh, that we get from double brackets flows. They instruct us that those kind of folded commutators mm have this expressive power that tends to, to express diagonalization. Now, which one you will populate with your operators, up to you. That, that's that's um, 
um, yeah, that's the same like optimizing difficult functions and how you do the optimization one starts and so on. That's kind of like the, the art of, of um, how to say, you kind of supervise some, some method of gradient descent or something like this. Here you need to supervise the, the double bracket iteration with correct operators and, and so on. So we're kind of a tangent, but uh, we've actually discussed it at some point, but uh, at least in the continuous case, no matter mm -hmm. which diagonal matrix D you choose, if you just like go with a uh, diagonal matrix with non-degenerate eigenvalues, then it is guaranteed that after infinite time you converge to the diagonal matrix. Yeah, so I think you have to change the uh, cost functions a little bit, but yeah, I was also looking at this that you can derive. Yeah, and it's quite simple. It's like two line derivation, so that's fine. No, but uh, wait. Uh, so even I can share. Maybe I'll share yeah. it for a minute. It's like this is guaranteed for any n uh, with real diagonal matrix with uh, non degenerate eigenvalues. And you can prove it just by noticing that this is positive. H should be bounded. So in time infinity, this should be zero. Uh, so, yeah. so I think in even in the discrete case, it should hold, although it might not be optimal. But the n is fixed here, or uh, can you scroll? yeah, and it's and it's fixed. It's just a constant. Uh, yeah, diagonal yeah. matrix. Yeah. The, so the problem, like you don't the, even need to flip the sign. But the problem is that um, that I'm choosing here very degenerate operators, and quantumly it's very difficult to get diagonal potentials which are not degenerate. Right. Yeah, that's true. So so this this is another difference, but that that's maybe a nice one. Maybe we we discuss this. Um, that's a paper by Brockett et al. And you saw dynamical systems showing up there. So this is a um, this is some of the best papers I think on on the stuff from dynamical systems. Um, so let's say I take d zero. I have seven qubits. I take the z acting on the first qubit. This has the generated eigenvalues. So to construct, um, to it's it's not so easy. I mean, next we will be discussing how to put those things onto a quantum computer, how to approximate those well, kind of markets. You can have set operators with like random disorder, then it'll be non-degenerate. But no, it will still be degenerate. I think, yeah, because it's... well, if the like set, uh coefficients are all different than like all inconsiderate um, but don't they become kind of cons because how is it so uh, basically you're proposing uh, d0 to be some b i z i yeah and isn't it still the Janet? Uh, maybe, maybe it's fine. Um, okay. Well, something to think about, but uh, because I thought it has like, Okay, so if that works, then then basically you can take very long s, and then then it, then it's um, then it's converging towards this diagonal. By yeah, in, in, in principle, you don't have to variationally choose, although that'll be that will give you like really bad runtime. But uh, um, but you might need those terms, and then you might need uh, some. Q, I, J, K times Z, I, Z, J, Z, K. And I'm not sure if this is not how that works. Why need to? Because, because it might be that there are still some kind of repetitions in the gaps or something like this. 
But they, I mean, now I see it that they say non-degenerate because sometimes people talk about degenerate gaps in the spectrum. So this Hamiltonian, I think, will have degenerate gaps in the spectrum, but it might have a non-degenerate spectrum in itself. So yeah, anyway, this is uh, something uh, that I didn't have so much on the radar so far. But uh, it just goes to say there's like a lot of literature on this stuff, so you can still get some things. I think that this maybe we can finish here, or we start discussing how to find out those things. Um, maybe let me prepare how to discuss this. Um, we can look at H of S to be h of zero uh, plus s the derivative of ds of s evaluated at s equals zero plus some higher order terms. And now the derivative of h of s is ds applied to s w zero h zero e to minus s w zero. And from this, we will see whether the the bracket goes out in the right way. But what do we get? We get, naturally, we get the commutator W0, H0, if we evaluate this as at S equals zero, okay? And this is H of zero, which is H0. So now maybe let me make a proof sketch. So sigma of H, of S squared, uh, HS is the scalar product of sigma of H zero plus sigma of the bracket W zero H zero A comma, the same thing. Let me just repeat this H0, and there's an S, and that's our derivative already evaluated at the right spot. Sigma W0, H0. Commutator close, close this thing, sorry about this. Plus all of S to power three, right? Uh, or uh, all to S to power two because th this stuff is all of s to power two. I'm neglecting those, I'm not making them explicit. So now if I expand this, I get uh, h0 sigma h0, uh, which is a good thing, plus s scalar product sigma w0 h0 comma sigma h0 plus the swap edge, this, uh, plus S squared, and then I have something plus O of S squared. So S squared would be the, taking the bracket with the bracket, but that's higher order. Okay. And now we see uh, how this is coming out because we get that sigma H of S, H S squared, minus sigma of h0, hs squared is, okay, I forgot two somewhere. This is 2s scalar product sigma of w0, h0, comma sigma of h0, close, plus o of s squared. So as we were expanding, we picked up one more term, but there's more terms anyway from the Taylor expansion. Okay, so this is how this appeared. And now, um, now there's maybe more things coming and there's a few derivations that we need to do. And, okay, we are almost there, so let me explain it this way. So if I take the trace of A times sigma of B, then this is always zero. This is because uh, 
if you if you look at what's happening is uh, delta of a i can write as a i i i i sigma i i and so if i multiply this with sigma um, i i i get that mm, this thing becomes sigma over i a i i trace of i i sigma of b but this be, uh, remains still off diagonal so this the sigma b will be something like i j for this to be non-zero but then it remains i j with some coefficients so basically this is an off diagonal matrix so it has to be zero so we have this equation here which is useful because above we have sigma of w0 commutator with, uh, what do we have, h0. And here I have h0 uh, minus delta of h0. Okay, so I will have trace of sigma w0 h0 times h0 all the stuff Hermitian so fine minus trace of sigma of this bracket w0 h0 close close delta of h0 and because of what I explained this is zero okay and now there's one more thing that we want to see is uh, wait is this fine? Or I messed it up. Ah, I should have expanded this one. Okay, same trick. Let me erase this. Because we, we are just reshuffling so that we get those brackets in. And this canonical bracket appears and that's where I want to finish. Um, so we actually keep the sigma. So, so we need to look at something like that. Trace of sigma of those brackets times sigma of the Hamiltonian. This one we will keep, which means this is trace of the bracket as it is, h0 times sigma of h0 minus trace of delta of this bracket w0 h0 uh, times sigma of h0. And this is what I was explaining here. This is zero. And now the last thing is that we have some trace cyclicity here so that I can move this one here. I can move this one here. And then I move this one here. And I will prove in one second why this is true. H zero, sigma H of zero. Uh, like that and then times w0, whatever that bracket was, okay? And this should be uh, the scalar product of w0 with h, actually here, sigma of h0, h0. Okay, so... So uh, there will be one dagger there and we get H zero sigma of H zero, which is delta of H zero, which is our canonical bracket. Okay. Yeah, something like that. That's roughly the derivation. So um, the last thing that I want to say is that you can check explicitly uh, an easy calculation. If I close this, then this is the same as trace B, C, preserving the order, and then A outside. Okay, this is something that we used here. And now you see, I may be messing up the signs because I'm going too fast, but uh, basically W0, let's just check, dagger is minus W0. Why? Because this is defined as D0 dagger, h0 dagger and i forgot to say we choose it to be hermitian uh, 
So wait, no, I'm going too fast here because that's exactly how not to do this. D0, H0 minus H0, D0. And so this will be H0 dagger, D0 dagger minus D0 dagger, H0 dagger. All of them are Hermitian. So this is my minus commutator of D0, H0, which is minus W0. Okay. So let me just go up and then we are done. D0, D0 diagonal and Hermitian D0 is equals to D0. D0 dagger is equals to D0. Okay. So let me just recap and then we finish. So the answers that I was discussing is what? Uh, the answers that I was discussing is that basically we rotate. Then we see that the derivative here, if we evaluate at zero for Taylor expansion, then this is a scalar product of this expansion here using this, this linear extrapolation. And within this linear approximation, we get the norm and some term here. And basically the scalar product, we were reshuffling now with two things, this one, and then the second one was this one. But basically, we can move the move this stuff around here, like that, and we recover the canonical bracket. So basically, this becomes a scalar product minus scalar product of m zero, uh, m zero comma w zero. So that's why you see I'm using m and w, okay? Because w is this variational, while m zero is the canonical, okay? That's the idea. Let me just go back to the main equation. This is why those things, this is a good answer because we were just discussing how this goes. Thanks to those bracket properties, you circle around and you see that you can express how much it changes in terms of the sub diagonal form. It's very unusual that you can make a statement like that, but it's possible exactly using the trace. So the off diagonal part after minus the off diagonal before, if you choose the sign correctly, can become a negative number. And if it becomes a negative number, it means that you reduced it. Okay. And that's uh, that's a form that comes from those continuous flows as well, because this is basically a, an approximation to a finite difference quotient. Okay. Maybe some more questions. Otherwise, I will stop sharing the screen. Um, so you see the slides here. I can. I was trying to avoid to talk about those differential equations. We define the iteration. We have the ansatz, and we were discussing how it appears if we start expanding that we shuffle around the brackets, that we get this kind of stuff that the difference of those of diagonal norms is negative. And if it's negative, it became smaller. And then we start repeating and repeating. That's the recursion. Maybe I will talk about the recursion next week. Uh, hi, Merrick. Yeah. Uh, I have just a silly question about uh, that. You show that uh, the of diagonal is, uh, element is reducing because it's negative, but uh, how do you know that it will become zero after some time, like? Yeah, so John Rack uh, pointed out the broken at all paper that basically there might be some other uh, things that are happening. Actually, what you can show, I was playing with this um, a few months ago. If you have the generate spectrum, you will get something that commutes with that operator ultimately at, at long times because there will be some oscillations, I think, or something. But anyway, um, uh, if you if you choose a certain operator with some degeneracies, at some point the, this norm will start bouncing back. So I think the, the archive paper. And if you evaluate it numerically, you're rotating the thing, and then then suddenly you you you're reducing this of diagonal norm, and then then it, then it becomes larger again. Yeah. Um, so that's why you make a recursive step. 
So you go as much as you can. Once you start increasing it again, because it's bouncing back, because there's some kind of finite recurrence of, of those oscillations, um, you just say, okay, let me choose a new generator. Let me switch the direction. And this, this we see. So this is a nice way to break symmetries and try to speed up the, the iteration, if that helps, yeah? So let's say you got as much you you were taking this different h of s and now you were trying to reduce this norm as much as possible but at some point it starts bouncing back so the first time it starts growing you say okay my local minimum at s0 and so i define a new hamiltonian to be this one but now my bracket w1 is a new bracket because it's for example some new operator u1 with h1 and you start, you rotate using that operator, not the previous one. Yeah? Okay. Uh -huh. but, but there is this effect that it can bounce back in practice. So I also oh. need to discuss with John Greg about that other paper, how sensitive it is to, to small gaps and so on. Oh, yeah? I see. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, I get it. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thanks. So basically, you have two options. Either you, you take something according to that theorem towards infinity, and it will work, yeah? According to the theorem, because there's some non-degenerate spectrum, bam, works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or it will start blowing up because you didn't reach infinity and it actually became worse or whatever. Then okay. you can stop before, as I'm describing here, choose a different operator and still continue. And fully heuristic, but it might be might be a better way. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.